Excellent. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Ted Tenoff. I'm a senior biotech analyst at Piper Jaffray. Athersys is a leading adult stem cell company that's developing multi-stem. Multi-stem is comprised of multipotent adult progenitor cells, or MAPCs. The company is developing multi-stem in several indications, including ischemic stroke, prevention of graft-versus-host disease, and ulcerative colitis with partner Pfizer. In addition, the company has preclinical 5-HT2C receptor agonist programs that could be partnered for obesity and schizophrenia. Here to discuss the Athersis story is my good friend, Gil Van Bocklin, Chairman and CEO. Gil? Well, hello again. Uh, what I'm going to try and do over the next few minutes, understanding I've only got about 12 or 13 minutes to... Um, to go through some, some key points is I'm just going to try and touch on some highlights, give you an update in terms of, uh, give you a, a description of, of what we're working with at the company, and then also talk about some of our key clinical programs. So uh, as, uh, as Ted was saying, we are privileged to be recognized as a leader in the regenerative medicine field. Um, we, we take that honor seriously, like many of the others that are here today. Our model is a little bit different from what you just heard from, from Mark. We're developing stem cells in a, in a bottle or stem cells in a bag, if you will, an IV bag, as a drug-like product that we can administer or clinicians can administer in an off-the-shelf manner. Um, we call this product multi-stem. I'll tell you precisely what the product is, how we make it, and I'll give you some examples of how we're utilizing it from a clinical and a preclinical perspective. The things that got us so excited about working with this technology over a decade ago when we first became aware of it is, is that this is a unique stem cell uh, type that actually can accomplish some things that are highly unusual in the context of traditional bone marrow transplantations or other stem cells, in the sense that once we've isolated cells from a healthy in, uh, individual consenting donor, we can actually grow the product up and make enormous quantities of it, as I'll talk about. We can then characterize that in a variety of ways, administer it in a variety of ways, but we can do so in an off-the-shelf manner, um, as, I'll, as I'll describe for you. We've got broad intellectual property around the technology, which is obviously very important from an investor and from a partnering perspective. I think those were key aspects that ultimately led to some of the partnerships that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, one of the, one of the problems that we faced very early on when we were working with this technology is what therapeutic indications do you go after first? And the reality of it is, is that we knew a lot about the basic biology of the cells that we work with, but we really didn't know what are the right clinical indications do you go after first. And so ultimately we decided, look, there's two ways to approach this. We can build infrastructure internally in an area like heart disease or in neurological conditions and just go deep in that one particular disease area. Or we can do what we ultimately decided to do, which is to build a very broad international network with leading investigators and key opinion leaders at leading research institutions and clinical centers across the United States and in Europe. And our logic was we can become black belts in manufacturing the product and in characterizing the product and doing a lot of analysis around the biology of it, but what we really want to do is put the, the, the product in the hands of people that are deeply knowledgeable about various disease areas and models to figure out where is it actually having a therapeutic effect, and then we can work with them to determine how are those effects, act effects actually being achieved. So we've concentrated pretty heavily over the past decade in three broadly defined therapeutic areas, inflammatory and immune disease, cardiovascular and neurological, as shown here. One of the other things that we did was we approached the FDA and other regulatory agencies in a very, uh, what I like to think of as a very positive and constructive way. We built a very strong foundation with them. And ultimately, what we were able to do was then leverage the early clinical safety data that we had generated from some of the initial studies that we ran so that we could then advance other clinical programs into proof of concept studies much more efficiently and much more cost effectively, which ultimately saves us and our investors time, money, and energy. So today we have five clinical stage programs, four of which are at or in mid-stage clinical development. And I'm not going to talk about all these programs today, but I am going to touch on a couple of key ones. I would also like to say that in one of the programs that I was talking about in the panel this morning, our ongoing phase two clinical, uh, clinical trial to treat stroke patients, um, we we're just announcing today that we have uh, received formal regulatory authorization in the United Kingdom to now include leading stro uh, stroke clinical centers in the UK who will be participating in that study alongside the 20 or 25 leading stroke centers in the United States that, uh, that are already committed to participating in the study. 
So what is multi-stem? Well, quite simply, multi-stem is a product based, as Ted indicated, on a, a very special class of cells called multipotent adult progenitor cells. So these cells can be obtained right from modest-sized bone marrow aspirates. You can also get them out of other tissue and organ systems. Uh, we and other investigators have shown this over the past decade or even going back a little bit longer than that. Once we isolate these cells, one of their unique properties is that we can grow them up in enormous quantities. And in fact, we've demonstrated that we can make banks using well-characterized banking procedures, master cell banks, working cell banks, and clinical dose banks. We can create banks that allow us to produce the equivalent of millions of doses of product from a single healthy consenting donor. And we can do this very reproducibly across donors as we've demonstrated over the past 10 years. Not only can we make a lot of the product, but we can store it for a very long time. In fact, we've already completed five-year stability studies that show that we can take our product, we can put it in a freezer, and literally it's stable for five years or longer. Another very important characteristic of these cells is that we can administer them like typo blood. We don't have to tissue match the original donor to the patients that we're putting the, pro the product into. So we can ad administer without matching and we can administer without immunosuppression. We've demonstrated, thankfully, a very consistent safety profile over the past decade both in preclinical studies that we've conducted as well as the clinical trials that we've been conducting. And as I was describing a little bit earlier, we now know that these cells, their primary purpose or effect is not to go in and just simply engraft and replace what may have been lost due to disease or injury or other types of conditions, but rather these cells are actually innately wired to home into sites of tissue damage, inflammation, and injury. And when they, when they get to various locations in the body, they interact in a dynamically regulated way, and their primary benefit appears to be trophic in nature, meaning they express a range of different factors to promote healing and tissue repair, reduce inflammatory damage, and do other things. So these are are not like the traditional tr uh, transplant procedure that many people are familiar with when they're thinking about bone marrow transplantation. And I'm not going to walk you through all the molecular details of it today, but there's plenty of more information on our website, and we have a whole bunch of publications out there that actually illustrate just how much we know about the biology of these cells and how they can actually shift the body's response in various types of disease or injury situations away from the inflammatory uh, type of mechanisms that are currently prevalent into a healing state. That's referred to is immunomodulatory activity. We also know that the cells can promote blood vessels in regions of ischemic injury or damage, so in the heart, for example, or as it relates to other types of ischemic injury situations. And we know that the cells can uh, promote neurogenesis, for example, or have neurotrophic effects. And again, we've published on findings that we've generated with many different independent labs. So I'm just going to focus for the next couple of minutes on some of our clinical programs, first concentrating on the inflammatory and immune disease area. Now, for those of you that are familiar with graft-versus-host disease or not so familiar with graft-versus-host disease, this is a very common condition in patients that are being treated for leukemia or other types of blood-borne cancers. And uh, in, these, uh, in these types of situations, patients will undergo chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and then will typically receive either what people typically refer to as a bone marrow transplant, but really it's either a hematopoietic stem cell transplant or a peripheral blood stem cell transplant. In animal models, you can, ref you can mimic what this disease condition looks like in humans, and that's what's shown here in these animals. And so the animal on the left, both animals, we actually could create graft-versus-host disease in these animals, and what happens, which is the same thing that happens in human patients, is you see multi-organ pathology. It's basically the, the adopted immune cells or the immune cells that are in the animals are just destroying a lot of the tissues and organs in the animals. And so within a very short period of time, you get what's seen, shown here on the left, an animal that is basically at death's door, and in fact, the same type of phenomenon happens in clinical patients where their skin begins to slough off, their GI tract becomes totally dysfunctional, they're experiencing constant pain and, uh, and multi-system uh, damage. Well, we published work several years ago that shows that we could give multi-stem in, in very severely uh, damaged or diseased animals and see complete recovery. And as you see here in the animal on the right, this animal has been treated with multi-stem, and it's a pretty healthy, normal animal. And in fact, if you go in and you do a deeper dive and you look at the gastrointestinal tract, you can see that we went from a situation that was highly inflamed and completely dysfunctional to actually reversing that damage. Well, this has ultimately became very interesting to our partner, Pfizer, who said, look, we're really interested in regenerative medicine. In fact, we've created a special business unit to focus on regenerative medicine, and we'd like to explore with you guys whether or not we can use multi-stem in particular clinical indication areas that we care a lot about and are very interested in. And so over a period of about 18 months, we spent a lot of time getting to know the team at Pfizer, and that ultimately culminated in a partnership that we announced at the very end of 2009, which is focused on the application of multi-stem to treat 
various forms of inflammatory bowel disease, so things like Crohn's disease or treatment refractory ulcerative colitis. And we are currently running a phase two clinical study, an international study, at dozens of sites across the United States, Canada, and Europe, which we expect to have data from in the relatively near, near term sometime uh, in the second half of this year. So again, this is a, a trial where we're administering multi-stem intravenously to patients that are really sick um, on the belief, based on years of preclinical work, that if we do that, we can actually help them get better where other treatments have failed. So the current standard of care have not had an adequate response in these types of patients. Now, our confidence in this study is also reinforced by some other clinical work that we've already completed. Namely, we've already run a small phase one study, a 36-patient study, in patients that are, again, at very high risk for graft-versus-host disease. Now, there's two ways to think about GVHD. You can wait until the patient actually gets the disease, or you can intervene early, right around the time of the transplant, and hopefully prevent or dramatically reduce the occurrence of the disease before it ever hap happens. So I refer to these two strategies as you're trying to put out the forest fire or you're trying to put it out at the campfire stage. We decided, based on work that we had done, that it might be better to actually intervene at the campfire stage, administer multi-stem right around the time of the initial transplant. So we did a lot of preclinical work. Ultimately, that was followed up by the clinical trial, which I'll uh, result here, and which was presented just a few months ago at the um, American Society for Bone Marrow Transplantation tandem meeting. Now, just to give you some specific numbers, we were focused on patients that are in the high-risk category. So roughly 50 to 70% of these patients are going to get graft-versus-host disease under ordinary clinical situations. And what we showed was that we could either give a single dose of multi-stem or a series of doses over time, and in both arms of the study, each of which involved about 18 patients, we saw dose proportional reductions in the incidence and severity of graft-versus-host disease. In fact, when we gave one really high single dose in, the, in this study, we saw that only one patient got GVHD, and it was very mild and transient graft-versus-host disease, which we were able to contain with other uh, types of complementary intervention. So we also looked at some other clinical uh, parameters, like, well, what does is, what is, uh, uh, engraftment look like? Do we see any instances of graft failure? 100% of the patients had successful engraftment. We also looked at platelet engraftment. Um, a lot of these patients, when they undergo these types of procedures, will experience chronic platelet insufficiency, and they have to go in for platelet transfusions over and over and over again. We saw very high rates of platelet engraf engraftment, and interestingly enough, it was happening very, very quickly, within about two weeks in a lot of these patients, which is a lot faster than what the historical uh, clinical profile would suggest should be the case. We looked at other clinical uh, measurements as well. So we were seeing a very strong picture that was emerging here that gave us a lot of confidence that, hey, maybe the thing to do here is to go to the FDA and put a plan in front of them so that we can actually move this into a phase two, three type of registrational study, which is exactly what we've done. We submitted our plan to the FDA with all of the corresponding data and information and statistical analysis, and they are now reviewing it, and we expect to hear back from them shortly. We've also advanced some other programs in the area of solid organ transplantation, which we're very excited about. Some of that work is going to be published shortly, and we're really excited about what that, uh, what that will show people. Okay, I've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to focus on one more program, that being stroke. So as we talked about in the panel earlier today, stroke is probably the quintessential unmet medical need in many respects. It affects an enormous number of people. The incidence of it is going to increase dramatically in the years ahead as the population over 65 in the U.S. increases by about 80 percent over the next few years. And we know that it, across the U.S., Europe, and Japan, it already affects about 2 million people a year, and this is going to go up by a, by a meaningful amount. And as the panel described, the current standard of care is totally inadequate. TPA has to be administered within about three to four hours. You can't give it after that time because it, you run the risk of it doing more harm than good. And th as a consequence of that, only about 5% of the patients actually get treated with TPA. Well, that's a big problem because it means 95% of them are getting palliative care. And if you're over the age of 65 and you suffer a stroke, the odds are worse than one in four that you're going to have to be permanently institutionalized. Okay. And another 25% are going to have to live with permanent substantial disability. Well, we've published work that shows that we could give multi-stem days after a stroke and see virtually complete recovery. And we took that evidence, we presented it to the FDA, we, and we ultimately got authorization to run what we are now doing, which is an international, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase two study where we are actually looking in ischemic stroke patients. And importantly, we're administering multi-stem within about one to two days after the stroke has occurred. So TPA, you've got about three to four hours. We think one to two days could actually be a very practical clinical time frame to intervene. And we believe that in doing so, uh, if this data reveals what we think it's going to reveal, it could be a major step forward in stroke standard of care.
All right, with that, um, just one final thought. We've done work in some other areas where we've administered multi-stem in a range of both acute and chronic neurological indications. We've seen some very compelling results. Again, all of this work being done with outside independent labs, uh, key opinion leaders and expert investigators. We actually see evidence of remyelination in models of multiple sclerosis as well as other types of neurological disease and injury. That, that kind of is the holy grail. The panel was talking about it earlier in terms of uh, in terms of what people would like to see in the space. So we're excited about this, and as I close, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have offline. Thanks very much.